So, hi everyone, uh, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking about mock objects in Zozo. Continuing uh, my sort of series of uh, talks about uh, unit testing. So, why exactly do we find ourselves needing mock objects well, for unit tests? What often happens in a unit test is that I am trying to test an object which has expensive dependencies. Uh, the uh, classical case is uh, a database. Now I'm going to be able to use a mock object if I know the requests that will be made to that object and what responses should be returned. So that is not the object being tested but is, is an object that the object being tested needs. And uh, an example from real life, uh, at Lightspeed I work on the on-site um, application and when I want to test an invoice, well, the problem is that as soon as I try to create an invoice, it says, oh, I'm going to read my information from the database. So if I want to run just one little test, am I going to create, then fill, then destroy a database just for one test? That, that seems a waste. And it would be a lot easier if I was able to say, well, sure, create yourself and read from the database, but in fact, you're going to read from a mock database. And the point then is that instead of making expensive requests to a real object, I'm going to be able to talk to the mock object while testing, and the mock object is not expensive. Uh, the mock will have been told what to expect and what to reply to the various requests. And the nice thing about that is that we can simulate errors at will. I can say, well, yes, the database is going to fail now. You are going to get nothing. And let's see, is the object being tested? Is the invoice able to handle the fact that when it requests uh, record number 15, that there is no such record? Can it handle it or not? So that's really good. And I can test, therefore, what requests the object is making as well as its handling of all possible responses. So this is the kind of thing that I want, but what is a mock object? It is this. Now, unfortunately, this is too small. You can't read, but the label says mock chicken loaf. And that is the point of a mock object. That is, it is cheap, like mock chicken. It is inexpensive. Yeah, because otherwise, why would you buy that? Uh, it is also, the calling code cannot see the difference, just as you can't tell that it's not chicken. When you're eating your sandwich, it feels the same, but you're saving money. And uh, the, an important part of what a mock object is is that it must know what calls it may receive. You must be able to tell it, yes, you will receive these calls and not those. And for each call, it has to know the response that it must give. And you can, if, you, if it gets a call that it was not expecting, it has to signal an error because that's the whole point of it. But also, you have to be able to ask it, did all your ex were all your expectations met? Did all the calls that were supposed to be made, were, were they all made, yes or no? Now, how can we code mock objects? They're used in many languages, and uh, I was trying to uh, ask myself how to code a mock object in Zozo. And basically this like, little diagram here, since calling code must not be able to tell the difference, this means that it must have the same interface as the object it is mocking, at least for the purposes of the calling code. So either it derives from the mocked class, so a foo object, well, you're gonna, you're gonna mock it with a mock foo and you're gonna say that it's super class is foo, or if you already have an interface, then if they both implement the same interface, that'll work too, and this may be preferable because you don't inherit all sorts of uh, weird behavior that you may not want, uh, depending on the, uh, the circumstances. But how are we going to substitute the mock object for the real object when you when we run tests because uh, especially if it's an important thing like the database and the technique uh, has a weird name and I hadn't uh, encountered it before it's, it's fairly recent I said what the hell is this injection thing is 
I'm afraid of needles, so I go, what the hell? Because what is dependency injection? Well, it's just a fancy name. When I you know, read up, and said, oh, that, yes, I've been doing that forever. So basically, we have to tell the object at some point, okay, this is your dependency now. This is the database that you're going to be using, or this is the foo you're going to be using. So you can do it in the constructor. You can say, well, whenever we build this object, let's say whenever we create an invoice, we have to tell it where its database is. Uh, that is the clearest approach, but it's also the most verbose, because you always have to pass it in the argument, and it can feel weird, because why are we always doing that? Uh, the approach that I've seen most often is in a setter, uh, where you go, well, let's set your database to this. Uh, it means you must define a new accessor, but it's, it can be cleaner, because you don't see this parameter passed every time you construct the object. Uh, and there's also another technique, but it's not an injection. Uh, it's cheap, but it works if you have a singleton. You can use a global state, and I'm mentioning this because that's exactly what I did initially when I had to mock the database in my, our unit tests. Well, it's a singleton object, and I was going, well, I can just say if this is a unit test build, then, and, and then I would check a global variable, said, well, am I running a unit test? If so, then, oops, I channel everything into the mock database, and that simplifies matters. Uh, it's less elegant, of course, but it works. But I was thinking, I want to be able to do something better. I want to do something the way that it's done uh, in OCMock for uh, Objective-C. Can I do that? I was wondering, because I'd like to have a generic mock object instead of making everything custom for every class I'm mocking. So in on-site, as I've said, I intercept calls to LSS database, and I send them instead to the LS database mock class, which I wrote. This works. It's convenient, but it's ugly and clumsy, and I cannot do that for everything. And it only works because the LSS database is a singleton. If it wasn't a singleton, I couldn't do that. A better approach would be to factor out the mocking logic, because it's the same idea. You have to have requests. You have to remember what you're supposed to reply. And so I was thinking, OK, can I make, can I make a mocking object so that I can mock any class by dropping in the mocking, I said mocking object, but the mocking component as a property of the real mock object. Can I do that? I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it. So the basic logic flow we have, sorry, that got back instead of forward. The logic flow we want is this. Basically, yeah, OK, you can see this. Uh, if I have a, a foo object, and I know that when I call the method bar with you know, certain parameters, then it returns the string alpha. Well, I want the mock foo to do the same thing, but inside, internally, it's going to, if you see here, this is what the, uh, the foo object does. But the mock foo is going to talk to its mocking object, and it's going to say, well, I, I got called with method bar with these parameters. Do you know what that is? And it's going to say, yeah, yeah, sure, I know. I, I, expect, you, I expect you to do that. I've been told that it's going to return alpha. Oh, okay, and then it passes, and the mock foo object knows how to, how to return alpha. Can I implement that? Well, yes, I can. And here's the various pieces of the puzzle. Uh, all these classes have xu as a prefix because uh, they're related to zojo unit. I wanted something to set them apart. But basically, I have a request. What's a request? It's a function call with its arguments. That's all I want. Although it's, it's, you know, all, but that's a bit complicated. I'm going to have a reply. You know, basically what the function call is supposed to return. And then what's an expectation? Well, it's just a request plus its reply. And then I actually implemented an expectation list as a separate class because it's a little bit cleaner and it manages a list of expectations. And it's got a couple of specialized functions. And then, when I've got that, I can assemble it into a mocking object. 
it holds expectations proper which have to be met but I also added the notion of stubs and I didn't invent that it was in OC mock stubs are expectations that may be met and sometimes it's like well I may call this length function zero or more times and I don't really care I just want you to say that no matter how often it's called because sometimes you can have a function that's called 10 times or whatever so you don't want to write 10 times yes you have to expect that once and then again and then again so I can do something like that now how to implement that from the ground up I learned about paramary which I had never used in Zojo before but this is fun it's used in a function statement to indicate that an arbitrary number of parameters can be passed which is nice because otherwise how are you going to pass an array when you don't exactly know this is convenient I define a function foo and I write param array nums as integers so that's an array of integers but it's an arbitrary number and it's called like this foo 123799 hey it de decides that there's five arguments or just two with three zero but if I try to pass three and a oops that won't compile because they're not the same type but this is a problem because if I'm going to describe a function's arguments, it has to be an array of arbitrary types, because functions have parameters of arbitrary type. So I need an arbitrary number of parameters, that's good, but arbitrary types, how do I implement that? And then I went over to the dark side. Variance. Uh, which is something that I had studiously avoided, because as Bob Keeney put it in his talk, uh, don't do that, you shouldn't use variants unless you have to, but in this case, I had to. So a variant is a special data type in Zozo that can contain any type of data, including arrays, so integers and doubles and strings and dates and arrays of the like. So that's great. And I went, that's wonderful. The parameters of a method call are going to be an array of variants. And I'm going to use param array so that I can write them in a natural fashion. I don't want to laboriously create an array and load it and then pass it. I want to do one single statement. So if I define an XU request, well, it has a method name because I have to know what method has been called. And it's a string. And then I have an array of variants for the arguments. And then I can use, uh, can define the function make request. I pass the method name, always starts with a string, and then I have a bunch of arguments that are variants. So the syntax is fairly simple. XU request dot make request, that's what you call a named constructor. Uh, and okay, I'm passing the call to the function open with arguments five and string eight. And this is what I expect. So I can define then, I have a, uh, have a request, a reply, much simpler. It's got a content, and what it's replying is a variant, whatever it is. And I've defined a shared method none, which that's a, uh, a pattern I talked about, I think, last year in my talk. Uh, it's going to return a shared property, s none, which is uh, private, and it's actually a reply that contains nothing, nil. No. And so I can just re write xu reply dot none, and that means this function does not return anything. Now I can define uh, an expectation. Expectation contains a request, contains the corresponding reply. And it's getting a bit verbose, because when I create an expectation, I want to say, well, okay, it's an expectation, and it's going to take the request, which is open, and five, and a, and then it, re it replies nothing. So this is getting a bit annoying to type, but when we reach the level of the mock object itself, we will be able to improve this so that we can have a more succinct way of writing it. Now, an expectation list has a reason to exist because it contains a little, an array of expectations, but it also has a specific method called addExpectation, which uh, 
is type safe, but that's not really important. What's more interesting is that I can tell it to consume a request. So basically, when I have a list of expectations, I can tell it, okay, well, I've got a request, find uh, your element, the first element that you contain that is for this request. And I've got an additional parameter, which is remove expectation, because there are two different behaviors. When I have a proper expectation that must be met once and only once, then I tell it, consume the request, you know, remove it once you uh, once you give me the reply, because the expectation has been met. But if it's a stub, it can be called zero or more times, so if you find it, well, then just give me the reply and leave it there. And this implements the difference in behavior between the two. And finally, I'm a bit early, <laughs> We're reaching the XU mocking object, which is my generic mocking object. So it's going to have a list of expectations that are removed once invoked. It's going to have another XU expectation list, which are stubs, not removed when invoked. I can ask it again, my XU mocking object, to add an expectation. I can tell it, hey, add a stub, and it will add in the proper list. I can tell it even at an even higher level, say expect, and then pass the method as string and uh, uh, an array of variants. And I can tell it to consume a request. And then the object will encapsulate the basic behavior, which is that you should always attempt to reply with a stub. And if there are no stubs, then you consume an expectation. This is uh, a... This is the, the pattern that I found in implementations of uh, mock objects. You might want to do something different, but this is what they do in other languages. And yeah, there's a function called validate, because uh, again, if I try to consume a request that is not there, then my mocking object will complain. It will log an error. But I also want to be able to ask it, have all your expectations been met? And if there are any uh, elements left in the expectations list, well, no, they haven't been met, so it should lock the errors. And if I want to mock an object, then I get something cool. I can add a mocking object as a property of the mock object. Then I intercept calls on the mock object. I say, well, when I get a call, I will ask the mocker to consume the, the uh, the request that corresponds to this call and return the reply, as we saw in the previous image. So if I've got my class foo that has an open function that takes a, a, an integer and a string, mock foo will have the same signature of a function. And then what it will do is say, well, all right, I will make a request. And that's the function has, is called open and I copy the parameters that were in my um, call list, then I'm going to ask my mocker to consume the request I've made and give me the, the reply, and then I will return, as it turns out, in this case, the integer value of the reply that was made. And this is, you know, really nice. And I can make uh, this even clearer because I'm going to define methods in mock foo specifically that create expectations. So, and this again is to make the uh, mocking code as clear as possible. I'm going to define an expect method that re, uh, takes the, the name of the function and a param array of variant arguments. And this basically just creates uh, a new request with the name and the arguments and add the expectation in the mocker object. And then I can have something like expect draw, which has all the parameters that just calls into this expectation method. And I can have something I don't think could be more concise. Basically, you're telling the mock you expect a call from the draw function with these parameters, these parameters. And I can just say in four lines, this is what you should get and, uh, well, in this case, there's, there's nothing being returned, but if there was something being returned, there would be a, a, final, uh, uh, a final note at the end. Now, this looks wonderful, and I can show you our classes. 
It's a nice little UML diagram. Oh, that's not very readable. I'm sorry, the resolution is crappy. Uh, we have the mock foo object, which contains the mocker, the mocking object, which has two lists of ex two expectation lists, and each one has zero or more expectations, and an expectation is has a request and a reply, and a request contains a string and an array of variants, and the reply is just one variant. So this looks wonderful. Uh, there are a few problems. And that was my initial goal, and I said, yes, I've got it. It's working, or is it? And there are a few flies in the ointment. The first is properties, property access, object parameters, and uh, problems with operator compare. So what is the problem with properties? The problem is that in Zojo, property access is not a function call. So a mock object can't intercept setting or getting a property. Now when I saw this problem, I said, of course it can. I'll just do it like an Objective-C. We'll define the properties as computed properties in the subclass. That doesn't work. Because those are not the same properties, even though they have the same names. So if you actually def define a computed property in a subclass, uh, depending on exactly where the program thinks it is, you will access one or the other uh, if you're not careful. So that will absolutely not work. <coughs> so you can't manage that, unfortunately. Of course, if you had computed properties in the first place, then that's not a problem. But if you have actual simple properties, uh, you're caught. And this is, you know, I wanted to close this with a demonstration of a mock object for the, uh, uh, not the graphics object, but the, is it graphics objects? Yes. I wanted to mock the graphics object, but that has properties. And so whenever the graphics object says something, you know, set the property, can't mock it, can't detect it's being called, so this, this is a real problem. And the other is uh, method signatures. You know, when you have objects as parameters. Uh, the thing is, the mocking object has to handle an array of variants for the method signature. But, you know, how much does a variant know about itself? Uh, it's okay if you're dealing with integers or doubles or even dates, but when an array, when a variant contains arbitrary objects or arrays of arbitrary objects, you don't know from the calling code exactly where you are. So already if you have an array of dates, uh, variant, and that's in the documentation, variant will say, yes, I, I have an array of objects, and you actually have to attempt to cast uh, the object into a date, and if it doesn't throw an exception, then yes, you've got a date, but otherwise, you're, you're kind of caught. So, uh, I, I saw a possibility that I might be able to use reflection to find a comparison method for the object being compared, but I figured this was going too far. I can't ask people to actually write special methods for objects that are found in a variant so that they can be recognized. This was, uh, this was leading to madness. And unfortunately, there is a solution, but it's not to use a generic mocking object if you've got uh, methods that take uh, objects, complicated classes, in their signature. You have to use uh, another approach. And finally, the uh, nasty little thing is that, assuming you could, there's another fly with comparisons, and, and this is a blame I must address directly to the uh, designers of the Zojo language. Because assume that we can intercept calls to the method foo that takes uh, coordinates, and chords being an object, that's very, very simple, a pair of doubles. So assume that I, I can intercept calls, 
And I'm going, well, you know, if I expect foo to be called, then I'm going to say if the parameter that was passed is equal to the expected coordinates, then do something. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows where this is headed. No? Oh, good. Uh, how can I compare the coords? Well, in Zojo, it's certainly possible. I define coords.operatorCompare. And that uh, nice function has to return minus one or zero or one to distinguish whether you know an object A is smaller than B or equal to B or greater than B. And this defines a total ordering on instances of that class. And as a mathematician, I was going, what? No, 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 there's a big problem with that. You can't, in the general case, define a total ordering in instances, even on something as simple as a pair of doubles. How are you going to compare two-dimensional vectors? Well, it's actually in the Zojo documentations. And they say, use their lengths. Right. Use their lengths. So that 0, 2 is equal to minus 141 and 1. We have this. This is true. If you compare uh, a pair of doubles using their length, then anything that lies on the same circle at the same distance from z the origin is equal, which is exactly not what you want when you want to make sure that you pass the exact same parameters. So, and this is an insoluble pr the, uh, unsolvable problem. You can't fix it because operator compare has to define a total ordering. Um, in, in C++, you define the operator equals and the operator is smaller than and those are different functions so you can make it work but here we're absolutely stuck so you can't define this operator and get the behavior you want you would have to define another function call it whatever you want you know uh, mock object equals where you compare each parameter in turn and that would work but then you can't you know use uh, simple syntax so, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> it's not easy to use uh, mock objects everywhere. We don't have a, a simple cure-all, much as I'd like to have one. But, so where can we use mock objects? We can use a generic mocking object to intercept method calls with simple parameters or arrays of simple parameters that will work. And for methods with messier signatures, we can break down objects into their component properties when doing comparisons. So instead of defining an operator compare, we literally have to say, well, okay, check that, you know, the x coordinates are the same and the y coordinates are the same, and, 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 and then you can, you can use that. And unfortunately, well, property access cannot be intercepted unless, as I've said, the mocked object itself already uses computed properties at the start, in, that, in which case we're still okay. So this would uh, suggest that if you want to use mock objects in your tests, think about designing for mocking. So extract an interface from your object and use computed properties, not direct access. And I'm going, wait a minute, but those are things that you should be doing anyway for big expensive objects, which happen to be the objects that you want to mock. So unfortunately, uh, this is not what was done for the graphics class. <laughs> That's not something we can change. But if you are uh, writing code that involves big expensive objects, database handlers or whatever, well, if you're doing it right, in the first place, then you can probably mock them for fun and profit. Now, the next slide was supposed to show you the GitHub repository where you could get the uh, code that I wrote that implements uh, mocking objects. Unfortunately, uh, I forgot that my company is now a public company and has a staff of lawyers, and uh, I can't just push code out to a public repository, and then beg for forgiveness later. And I was a bit 
late in asking for permission, so the request is still making its way up the hierarchy until it comes down. I'm, I'm certain that I will be allowed to do that, but I don't want to get in trouble with light speed after eight years of the company <laughs> uh, and before my, I can uh, vest my stock options. So, <laughs> uh, so I apologize. I will make this available as soon as I can and I will send uh, information to Zozo so that anyone who's interested can get it because I've got, as I said, the framework for mocking object with full unit tests so that you can see that it works. Um, and uh, although I have not been able to effectively mock the graphics class as much as I wanted, uh, I think that this is, uh, this is usable as it is for at least certain applications. And uh, uh, once it is released, I will be you know, very happy to share it with the world. Now, if there are any questions, I'm all ears. Yes? So you mentioned about how it's difficult to identify an object in, in a way that's sort of there. Is this introspection? Is it introspection what you said? Yeah, I was... Um, I, yeah, um, the question is that uh, if I identified uh, difficulties in identifying objects and arrays, could introspection help me? Yes, I was uh, looking at, into that. Uh, this was expanding the scope of the talk to a little bit more than I had time to prepare for. I'm expecting, however, the, impre the impression I got very much was that uh, you're kind of expected when you're using introspection, you expect to identify classes. If you're using it, it's like, oh, is this this class or that class? But if it's an arbitrary class, the problem is that you then have to check, does it have these methods or those methods? And if I go there, well, sure, but then I get to the point where this class, in order to be comparable, must implement certain methods. And I was going, well, yeah, but then if, in order for an object to be used in a mock, it has to have these methods, th this is kind of um, derailing the, not derailing, it's, it's, it's not meeting the goal. I wanted something that could be used in a generic way as much as possible. Because otherwise you might as well say, well, okay, all of those objects that I'm, uh, that I'm writing have to have these methods that will be called directly when I'm trying to mock. So you would g get rid of the mocking, the generic mocking object, and you could use something more direct, but that's far, far more intrusive. Which I think is probably the wrong trade-off in general, but you might have uh, a situation where it, where it is absolutely the right solution. Uh, I was, I guess, hoping to, to be the, uh, I forget the name of the, the guy who did OCMOC for Objective-C, but I wanted to be him for, <laughs> for Zozo. But there are, I think, we would need direct language support for some of the constructs that are needed uh, in order to do that. But, uh, uh, yes? Um, in the Bitcoin 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 Okay, so the comment is if we use param array uh, with an arbitrary number of parameters, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's true. Uh, yeah, the comment is that autocomplete will not recognize that as an array. Yes, that is indeed a, a, a drawback. Yeah, but if I put para okay parentheses around one, two, three. Oh, in the declaration, primary nums. Yeah, I should have. Uh, I'm wondering though if that isn't inter. Right, right. You're correct. I should have put parentheses after nums and. Uh, Okay, autocomplete will work then. Okay, yeah, you have more experience with that than I do, obviously. I had never used parameter before, but then, you know. And again, this was done for uh, syntactic convenience, because otherwise at first I thought, well, yeah, I can just create the array explicitly and then pass it and it will work, but it is very verbose, because I have to de define an intermediate variable, then fill it, then pass it to the function. So I wanted something that worked. Uh, quickly. Uh, so thank you for that uh, remark and I will uh, see if I can uh, <laughs> modify that in the code. Uh, 
Uh, anything, any other comments? Or have I stunned you all into uh, comprehension? No? Okay, that, that went by faster than expected. Thank you very much.